All right, let's see if we can get this recorded. I'm a little bit on the outside of my home in Le Dome, so if we have the soothing sounds, pitter-pattering rain coming down during this lecture, just it might get annoying, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so I want to talk about anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders in children and adolescents today. This is from uh, one of those chapters in your book. Um, oh, already I got problems here. Okay, so this general principle, and I'm not going back because, yeah, only one word is cut off, so I'm going with it, okay? A general principle in psychopathology is that psychological symptoms can be thought of as distortions of normally adaptive processes. Okay, so there's a couple of words chopped off. Um, these normally adaptive processes are usually good for us. They usually... Uh, help us with things. On average, statistically, throughout the history of the human race, they have helped us to avoid danger, to maximize our benefits, to stay alive, get calories, reproduce, etc. Evolutionary stuff. So, uh, every psychological symptom that I can think of, even some kind of weird ones, you know, I've talked to some people, there's some pretty rational ways to think of them. Now, this isn't necessarily an explanation or a cause. I mean, this is very post hoc, after the fact, backwards, you know, hindsight reasoning. Oh, well, evolutionarily, it must have been because of such and such. And there's problems with that reasoning. If you're an evolutionary psychologist, there are sometimes ways that you can solidify your evidence using certain kinds of research. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just saying there's a way to think about it. This is just a way to conceptualize the problems that we talk about. Um, and I think it's helpful to think about symptoms as being normally adaptive processes. They get exaggerated, they get distorted, they get applied in the wrong situation, and then they become something we would call a symptom because then they start hurting more than they help, which is kind of sort of the, de the definition of what a psychological symptom is. So let's talk about the three components that go into all anxiety disorders. Now there's some other stuff too, but these three components get remixed like, you know, beans, rice, and sour cream in Mexican food. Well, American Mexican food. Real Mexican food does not have sour cream. Okay. Um, beans, rice, and chilies. Tortillas, beans, and chilies. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, those, these things get remixed to make all the different anxiety disorders that we currently talk about, that we currently have specified in the DSM. And they're not the same thing. So fear is in some ways the most basic. It's the most immediate. That's when you have an alarm reaction. You just, uh, it's your fight or flight response. Fear is immediate and there we go. Okay, I made a bad mark, but let's just go with it. So it's an immediate fight or flight reaction. So it's the, oh my gosh, fight or flight. I got a fish or cut bait, get out of here or fight or something. Um, everybody has a different way of dealing with it. Some people say that there's a third response, fight or flight, or like play dead, freeze up, and that's also adaptive in certain situations, or we wouldn't, well, that's bad logic. It's thought to be adaptive, and we probably wouldn't have it, have it if it wasn't, but there are ways in which that can be adaptive too. So fear is immediate. There's an immediate threat. It's right here, or it's going to be right here, right, just, you know, in a few seconds or a few minutes or something like that. It's an immediate threat. And this is often thought to be more emotional than anything else. It's not a lot of thinking going on. It's automatic. Anxiety is usually thought of mostly as an emotion, but there's definitely thinking going on. Anxiety changes the way you think, and it's mediated by thoughts. You have to be thinking about something before you can have the anxiety. But we mostly think of it as emotional. It's future-oriented. So anxiety is about something that hasn't happened quite yet, but will happen in some future time. It's uncontrollable, or sorry, it's not uncontrollable, it's thoughts that we have about things that might be uncontrollable and unpredictable, those make our anxiety much worse. If there's something that you can totally control, your anxiety tends to be fairly low. If there's something you can predict, then uh, you can have some sort of control, even if it's just being able to be emotionally prepared for it, and so that tends to be not as much anxiety, usually. Those two things make it much worse. Now this is for aversive events, and we have to say that because there was research in the 60s and 50s, I believe, um, that suggested that any kind of autonomic arousal, anything that gets your blood pumping, uh, could cause distress, could be bad for you. And I think the evidence on that is a bit mixed. They're like, oh, the fact that you just got your dream job, that's actually kind of terrifying. Well, yeah, not nearly as terrifying though as losing your job. So. The aversive events tend to be much worse in causing anxiety, and that's what we tend to focus on. People don't usually get 
you know, an anxiety disorder diagnosed because they just feel so awful because tomorrow the love of their life is going to make them the happiest woman in the world or whatever. That doesn't tend to be, to be a big reason why we have um, disorders. So anxiety is involved in attention. When we have attention or when we have anxiety, we focus on the thing we're anxious about. I've, I've said this in this class before, an awful lot of mental disorders and symptoms look like ADHD. And anxiety is one of the big reasons why. When you're anxious about something, it's hard to think about anything else. You're anxious, so you think about the thing you're anxious about. So you think about the event, the aversive events, and you think about what you're gonna do in response to them, if you have any kind of response that you think is gonna be helpful, etc. cetera. So uh, finally, the last component is worry. Worry is often thought to be a thinking thing, but as you know, it's very much emotional as well. We sometimes classify that in intro psych terms as, well, worry is the thinking and anxiety is the feeling. It's not quite that cut and dried. Um, worry is future oriented just like anxiety is, but worry is the part where you ruminate and you think about things over and over again, but it's almost always tied to the anxiety. Worry and anxiety go together hand in hand and studying them separately is not the most uh, helpful thing sometimes. Although, of course, as psychologists, we try and separate as much as we can and try and figure out what's going on and then put them back together, etc. Worries tend to be intrusive. They're intrusive thoughts. In that way, they look a little bit like the obsessions in OCD, which is you know kind of recursive because OCD is thought to be an anxiety-mediated thing too. So they're intrusive. They're difficult to, to control. When you're worrying about something, you kind of can't stop thinking about it. And then you have those anxiety feelings every time you think about it. So fear, anxiety, worry. Um, the etiology for all of these things is hypothesized to be a diathesis stress type etiology. So people have a genetic predisposition. And then based on that genetic predisposition, the events in their life, which might be as fundamental as the event of having a certain kind of chemical composition of the fluid in the womb, or it could be something like being abused as a child or neglected, or it could be something like having a terrible experience where a dog bit you very badly when you were young or something like that. Anyway, some kind of event that happens in your life or series of events or pattern of events kind of turns on, like turns your potential for a disorder into a disorder. <coughs> now, one of the things that's been studied fairly extensively is this concept called temperament. Temperament is sort of like proto-personality, like ur-personality, like fundamental baseline biological personality as like the building blocks of personality. It's the personality you have when you're born. And so there are a few dimensions. Some people say as many as like five or six. Some people say fewer. But one of the dimensions tends to be how much behavioral inhibition ability and tendency that you have and we talked about behavioral inhibition before we went on you know our forced break because behavioral inhibition is thought to be um an executive function that's how we conceptualize this but if that executive function is out of control and is functioning constantly all the time that's not good for us you need to have some behavioral inhibition right <laughs> or else bad things happen in your life but if you have too much behavioral inhibition you are inhibited you have a hard time taking action when doing so would get you things that you want and things that you need so this is a fundamental um, building block of anxiety and you can predict to a certain extent who's going to get anxiety disorders certainly not perfectly but you can get you can wildly increase your accuracy in prediction predicting who's going to get anxiety disorders by studying which babies like infants have more behavioral inhibition. And you study things like if you present a novel stimulus, do they shy away or do they go, ooh. Now I have a neighbor baby named Ani. He's the baby of um, a costume designer and a lighting or a set designer at Fredoni in the theater department. And he is the most fun baby I have ever met in my life. He's so much fun. I can't put other people's babies' pictures and videos, but man, just everything makes him laugh his his mother learned early on that he loves to be stuck in the baby carrier and walking around even if it's sleeting and snowing in his face he's just kind of like this is interesting little baby he's toddling now he's he can walk now but he's got very very low behavioral inhibition he's got curiosity coming out the ears and some babies very much even small changes in their environment they're instantly concerned even fearful so babies are different in that dimension that dimension of behavioral inhibition is 
uh, a temperament factor that we study. And it's probably one of the big things involved in basic anxiety proneness, the diathesis component of the diathesis stress that goes into whether you're going to get an anxiety disorder or some symptoms or something. And there's a lot of psychosocial factors that have been studied, and we've harped on these a lot in the past. They still matter. The genetics matter a lot. These genetics are really quite important. They account for a lot of the variance in who gets disorders and who doesn't. And the genetics seem to be expressed largely in this temperament variable. Um, but there are other things too. Parenting, we blamed moms a lot in the past because it wasn't just parents, it was moms for their children having any kind of psychological disorder. We know now that it's that we overdid that. But it, it is interesting that even children who are adopted into families where a parent, especially if it's the main caregiver, which is usually the mom still, I mean, we have a very still gender segregated world as far as that goes. So, that, so if their main caregiver has anxiety symptoms, children are more likely to develop them, even if the children have no genetic predisposition for that, or at least not an increased one. So modeling by the parent and reinforcing conditioning, all these things, mom models being scared of new things, or dad, um, like reinforces the child by reassuring them the child has an experience that like whatever but then the dad's like oh i'm so glad you're okay and the child you can see, see the little gears running i think sometimes like oh i was supposed to be scared okay i will be like children are trying to learn how to fix their world so when i was um in early grad school i met my sister at, at home and my parents had gotten a hot tub for some reason we didn't care why so there's snow falling all around us just up north of seattle and all the kids are hanging out, not all the kids, we wouldn't all fit. Some of the kids are hanging out in a hot tub. And my sister's daughter, who is now like almost 30, but anyway, my sister's daughter, Gabrielle, is um, two, there's three, and she's in the hot tub. Now in the middle of the hot tub, it's too deep for a three-year-old to touch. It was like three and a half feet deep in the middle. And we were sitting on little benches on the edge and we were throwing Gabrielle back and forth in the water and she was having fun, whoosh, go to one adult, whoosh, to another adult. There were four or five of us. And one time, and Gabrielle is kind of a fearless kid. I mean, she's just turned out to be kind of a fearless kid. She's the one you want next to you if you get in a bar fight. Like, she, you want her on your side. And she's always been that way. But it was so interesting when my sister Shauna, like, launched her over to me or somebody else and we missed the catch. She didn't go far enough. We missed the catch. And she popped her head under the water for a second. We pulled her right back out. And she's sputtering. Plop, and there's a second where she doesn't know what to do. And she looks at her mother. Now that is called social referencing. When you look around you to find out how you should evaluate a situation. So children do social referencing with their main caregivers more than anybody else. And Gabriella's mom was definitely her main caregiver. So she looks at my sister and, and there's just uncertainty on her face as she's like <laughs> coughing a little bit. And then her sister, and then my mom, my sister, boy, it wasn't Freudian, it's just bad language. And then Shauna says, uh, oh, Gabby, come here, oh, baby. And then Gabrielle starts crying. And if you watch kids, you'll see this a lot. The children, something happens to them. They get hurt or they get startled or something like that. And then in, in many cases, they will look to their caregiver or the people around them before they react. And if, they, if the people around them, well, I have other sister. Um, she's big. She's my size or slightly larger in all dimensions. She's not really fat. She's just a Viking. We have some of those in my family. And her husband is six foot seven and weighs about 350 pounds. And he played um, high school football. He's just a big guy. And their little boy, Connor, when he was a toddler, I visited them and I saw him, you know, toddling around and slimy and drooling in diapers. And he falls down and smacks his face. Now it was on the carpet, but still that hurts. Like it probably bumped his nose, you know, that horrible feeling. And he looks up and his dad says, Good job, son. Get up and get in there and do it again. And he gets up and smiles and stomps around again. Very different, right? He had a painful, startling experience. And his, and I'm not saying either of these people, you know, did or didn't get anxiety disorders. Gabrielle does not have an anxiety disorder, as far as I can tell. She seems a perfectly psychologically healthy kid. But these were, these were differences in social referencing. And you can imagine that extreme versions of these, especially, especially extreme versions of anxious parenting, could lead to... Um, an anxiety disorder in a child who was genetically predisposed in some way to get that disorder. So it can make a difference. But remember, the big difference is the genetics. The genetics here 
are the big difference. And so then you have attachment style. And this is, okay, so this is like a big influence, the genetics. This is smaller. And this is the smallest. So attachment style has been studied quite a lot. You know, you've got the, the uh, secure attachment, which is the healthy, happy one where, it, and it's supposed to be attachment to your parent. Now, by the way, the, the assessment of attachment in infants is, I think, pretty solid and pretty pretty valid, but the assessment of attachment in adults, it's a different thing. It's a whole big conversation to have. But anyway, who have an anxious avoidant, which is one of the bad kinds, attachment style, they have about a one in four, closer to one in three chance of having an anxiety disorder by the time they're done with childhood. And only about 13%, about half of the percent of securely attached infants have that. So you double your risk going from 13% to 28% if you have an anxious avoidant, avoidant attachment style. Now attachment style itself is influenced by both genetics and by parenting and, and early life experience, which is heavily parenting. When you measure this, you're an infant. So anyway. There are patterns of normal fears and compulsions. I'm going to talk mostly about fears that happen. And these patterns mimic in a lot of ways the kind of evolutionary dangers and challenges that we have to get through in our lives. Now Freud, Erickson, all sorts of people came up with these stage theories that at this age the child has to grapple with such and such and at this age they're worried about such and such. Talk to Dr. McFall sometime. The stage theories tend to fall apart. They tend to not work nearly as well as people think they do. But there is something to them in that when you're in a different period of development, you tend to be concerned with different things. You sort of have different tasks and different trials that you're working with and things you're concerned about. And so a very light version, um, not strong version of stage theories might make some sense here. So there are some trends by age that tend to be consistent across many, many cultures. There are very few cultural differences in fears. One of the things this should automatically tell you is maybe this is genetic. Now, of course, maybe cultures all evolved, or the ones we've studied, have all evolved and ended up in such a way that they all have certain things in common, and that's what makes these things go. But that seems less likely in this situation. It seems like, especially with other information, that there's just a strong evolutionary genetic effect on when people get certain fears and what kinds of fears they get. So fears are quite common in kids. Fear is a major component of childhood. Fear is adaptive. Fear keeps you from dying and from getting hurt and from getting poisoned and all kinds of stuff. So um, fear is a good thing in general. I mean, without there are people who live without fear and their lives are ironically terrifying to the rest of us. There is a story I heard on the radio of a woman who will not be identified by the people who study her. She's not worried about it because she doesn't feel any fear. But she had a brain disease that seems to have taken away any capacity for feeling fear when she was a young teenager. She remembers what it was like to feel fear, but she can't feel it now. And there was a terrible situation where a man um, got, when she was in college, or maybe a little after that, held a knife to her throat and said he was going to kill her. Most of us would respond by saying, fine, take all the money, do what you want. Her response in this fascinating interview I heard with her I wish I knew her name. Actually, I'm glad I don't because she would be a vulnerable person. Um, but her response was sort of fascinating. It was just kind of like, fine, do it, you coward. What are you afraid of? And the guy was saying, aren't you afraid of dying? She said, no, I'm not afraid of dying. What are you afraid of? Just do it. And he was so weirded out by that that he ran away. Now, he might easily have actually hurt her, and she got very lucky that he didn't, but it was such a weird response for most people. She just doesn't feel fear. She feels pain but then she's not afraid of the thing that might cause her the pain again. And she's been in some terribly dangerous situations because of this, and she's almost died several times because she doesn't feel fear. Fear is good, fear, but too much fear is what we're talking about when we're talking about anxiety disorders, of course. So um, parents may under-report the fears that their children have for a variety of reasons, including you know, social norms and also not recognizing that the fears are serious, things like this. But overall, girls tend to, as far as we can tell, have larger numbers of fears than boys, although it might just be that girls report more fear than boys. And then with age, everybody gets fewer fears 
and the and then fears kind of translate into worries for most people now for most people um, the worries don't become excessive but for people who are uh, who have a genetic predisposition towards anxiety disorders then the transition from fears to worries is a transition from extreme and maladaptive and unhelpful fears to extreme and maladaptive and unhelpful worrying and then the worries become more complex as our brains become more complex as we're as we're more able to understand things our fears are based on our ability to understand the world we're afraid of the things that we can understand and they're based on uh, the complexity uh, of the tasks that we have to do in our lives so anxiety can be normal or disordered anxiety anxiety is good for us too i really hate these motivational things why would you worry worrying does nothing for anybody and i would say no worrying helps there's a moment in the road to el dorado where one of the characters says you worry too much it's a buddy movie and his buddy says no i worry exactly the right amount <laughs> and that's that's perfect that's what we evolved to do hopefully is worry just the right amount worry prepares you for situations worry helps you be ready when bad things are going to happen to you so worry like fear it's bad when it's in excess when it starts to cause problems but everybody worries well almost everybody worries except people with very rare conditions um and worry by itself is not a terrible thing well the prevalence rates um the yeah this slides about anxiety same thing with anxiety everybody has anxiety too the prevalent the prevalence rates are about 12 to 20 percent of children who have kind of clinically concerning anxieties during childhood at some point so that's a lot that's up to one in five 20 percent is one child out of every five so the high end of that estimate is really big and the low end is you know one in one in eight one in ten something like that that's a that's a pretty big range that's a lot of kids and comorbidity kids who have anxiety disorders tend to have more than one disorder if you have an anxiety disorder you're more likely to have two or more disorders once again suggesting either that there's something interlinking these things and or maybe our diagnosis system needs some work if we're constantly giving people multiple diagnoses maybe it needs to be simplified in some way and there are people working on this and arguing about it constantly so let's talk briefly about the frequency of disorders and when they and then the ages that they happen during childhood and adolescence so frequency here look at the tallest bar when you see graphs like this to say which is biggest which is smallest and then get more interesting after that so social anxiety disorder way up here now way up there is a little over seven percent about seven percent of children in this study now this isn't the definitive final answer it's just an answer about seven percent of children <coughs> before their adults will have social anxiety disorder um, just below that is specific phobia specific phobia is quite common and it's more common in um, childhood rather than adolescence so like elementary school and before and then down below that you have generalized anxiety disorder now generalized anxiety disorder kind of creeps up with time for reasons I'll discuss later and then separation anxiety disorder which is more or less a disorder of younger children and then down below that you have panic disorder and agoraphobia now agoraphobia by itself I always thought it was fairly rare but apparently it happens a reasonable amount in children but panic disorder and agoraphobia usually go together well panic disorder brings agoraphobia agoraphobia doesn't always bring panic disorder but panic disorder almost always has agoraphobia to go with it so let's look at this little chart here now what this chart is is showing the percentage the cumulative percentage of children well estimated in a population who have a particular mental disorder at a certain age so I'm gonna put a line there that's the 50% line because that's an interesting line that helps us kind of anchor ourselves when we look at these each of these has a curve um, so if, if a curve goes up and to the right like uh, the SA the SAD curve here let's just click on SAD so separation anxiety disorder is that line right there the the dash two dots line that line goes up and then plateaus so a quick rise in early childhood toddlerhood and then not very many people uh, after like age so you can see it's we've got a very quick rise coming up here and then up here not very many people are developing the disorder from there on so you've got uh, that pattern or 
you've got this pattern over here for panic disorder that has a very gradual rise for a while and then later on it it becomes steeper and then more and more people develop so some not very many people are developing the disorder early on but then later a number of people do so um, separation anxiety disorder I put this yellow bar to kind of show you roughly the pattern lots of kids develop that when they're toddlers about 50% of the kids who will ever develop that disorder develop it by about age three or four this isn't super precise this graph but it's roughly it's roughly right from the data I have Oh, I'm sure you can hear that really droning lawnmower. All right. Um, specific phobia over here. It's this little solid line. Specific phobias are another young children's disorder mostly. There aren't a lot of grown-ups with specific phobias, despite how much we kind of talk about that culturally. The percentage of grown-ups who have specific phobias is fairly small. Most specific phobias are in young children. So it's an elementary school disorder most of the time. So here's the pattern. Again, it's most common in preschool kids and maybe early elementary school kids. But if you want to get to where 50% of the kids who are going to ever have it have it, then you go to about age six. So by age six, about half the kids who are ever going to get a, a phobia have the phobia. And then social anxiety disorder here is that the pale blue line, I don't know if you can see, hopefully the arrow shows you which line it is. That one's more of like a gradual rise type thing. Social anxiety disorder picks up time as you go along. It's kind of like an exponential curve, which in the age of coronavirus, I'm sure everybody's seen lots of exponential curve graphs. It's sort of looking exponential-ish. But then of course it, it does pap plateau out. You just kind of can't see it in, in this range, but it continues into adulthood. But up here, eventually it's gonna you know, plateau out at some point. And it's not going to be just, oops, can't do, can't undo that. All right, I'm going to leave those ugly marks there. It's not going to be like people keep getting it at high rates into their 20s and 30s. Like most of the people who get it are going to get it fairly early on. Look at the midpoint, uh, about age 13 is when half the people who have social anxiety disorder are going to get social anxiety disorder. Now, 13, most people don't have a lot of happy memories of 13 or at least they have a few pretty terrible ones because 13 is a scary time and that one of the reasons is because we've become a bunch of mindless pack animals at that time when you're 12 13 14 that's the peak of conformity pressure for most people never before and never after in their lives will they ever feel nearly as much pressure to be accepted by other people around them. So that's when you get people afraid to like the wrong music and afraid to wear the wrong clothes and say the wrong things at school. And middle school is a mess. And my wife has this theory that we, sh we shouldn't even, we should abolish middle school. She's saying nobody learns anything anyway. They're all just a mess of, of fear and anxiety and hormones anyway. So instead of middle school, junior high school, we should just send kids and make them be apprentices and learn something like go, go learn to install electrical appliances go learn how to sew some things, go learn how to like do telemarketing, something, go learn some trade, and then come back when you're like a human, when you're about 15, you know, I, I don't know, it seems to make sense to me. Anyway, social anxiety, social anxiety disorder peaks when social anxiety peaks, which is right around age 13-ish. Um, and then we have generalized anxiety disorder. Now this is an interesting one because we'll talk about it later. It's a special disorder. The median um, diagnosis age is around 17 or 18 years old. Social anxiety disorder, the diagnoses keep coming, partly because a lot of these earlier diagnoses are probably manifestations of generalized anxiety disorder. There's an argument that GAD is not a disorder in itself, it is just the basic underlying anxiety proneness, which is a disorder maybe, maybe isn't, I don't know, it's a definitional issue. It's like a different level of disorder. It's the it's the base underlying all the disorders. It's the broth from which all the soup is made. And finally, we have panic disorder, which is one of the reasons I became a psychologist, because I had a friend with panic disorder in high school. Um, the big reason is because later in college, a girlfriend told me to get a major or get a new girlfriend, so I declared psychology to be a major. Um, yeah, we broke up soon after that, but psychology was super cool, so I stick with it. So 
a panic disorder peaks around, well, the midpoint is around age 20. So people in their adolescence and early adulthood, that's when you're gonna see a lot of people developing panic disorder. So you can kind of see the temporal precedence of these things happening uh, through a person's life. Panic disorder has an awful lot to do with abstract things. You're, okay, the, the disorder itself is deeply biological, but the stuff that you become concerned about tends to be fairly abstract. GAD it has its own reasons for being up there. Social anxiety disorders, you need to be able to understand social things. You need to understand abstract things like the possibility of social rejection before you can get social anxiety disorder specific phobia you have to understand specific objects in the world and specific things can be scary and then separation anxiety disorder little kids are afraid of separation their main protection against all dangers is to stay close to a caregiver so specific phobia uh, actually I'm gonna take a break here and get online with some of my students so let's stop the recording right here for a minute.